Bulbas. Bulbas. Why for art there bulbas? That there be the question. Concerning which I wants to rant on. Because I've just upgraded from 1983 bull bar technology to 21st century bull bar technology. So I'm in a position to make a bit of a comparison. And over the years, I have had a fair bit of commentary from anti bull bar individuals to the effect that I was a bit of a wicked person for having a bull bar because they thought that it had the look of being a potential death trap for any pedestrian that I may be inclined to run into, which is not why I have a bull bar at all. I don't have a bull bar for running into pedestrians, but we might as well deal with that aspect straight away. If you get hit with this 1983 touring wagon bull bar, the top rail or tube is the leading edge of the bull bar. It sticks forward at about five degrees from the vertical, which in itself has taken to be a wicked evil thing by the anti-bull bar lobby because the bar's 28 inches or about 72 centimetres above the ground. So the scenario is that if somebody's less than say 1.4 metres tall, then they are going to be thrown forward by the bull bar onto the road. And so their little head, which will be roughly yay high off of the ground, is going to be catapulted onto the ground. And I've got to say, the quadrant of arc for that 1.4 metre tall head to run into the ground is fairly large compared to what happens to anybody who's over 1.4 metres tall. Because if it's an adult pedestrian who walks in front of the car and gets hit by the bull bar at 28 inches above ground level or 72 centimetres, the adult's legs get swept up from under them and the adult then rotates onto the bonnet, which is not a good thing. It's specifically not a good thing because between your ear hole and your eyeball on the inside of the skull, in the inner table of the skull, the skull's made up of three bony layers, an outside hard solid layer, a middle spongy layer, an inside hard solid layer. On the inside hard solid layer or table of the skull, between your ear hole and your eyeball, there's a groove sculpted out of the inside hard table of your skull. In that groove, there's a thing called the middle meningeal artery. And when your head runs into the bonnet of the car, what happens is it flexes your skull. And when it flexes your skull, it breaks the inner table, it ruptures the middle meningeal artery, and your grown-up who runs into the bonnet with their head requires burr holes. Someone has to lift the skin flap expose the skull, drill into the skull, and use a vacuum cleaner to suck the blood clot out. Otherwise, they can remain unconscious and die. Whereas I put it to you that the longer quadrant of arc between the head and the road gives the individual thrown forward in front of the car sufficient time for their arms to be flung upward by the momentum and protect their head. So it's not so likely to be a head injury issue with the child flung in front of the bull bar. The difficulty is going to be the bottom mounting of the bull bar, which is 14 centimetres or 10 inches off the ground. The rest of the car does have big bits of it that hang down lower than that. And what happens is that if the wheels run over the kangaroo or the pedestrian, they're in very dire straits. Otherwise, they tend to get wedged. Entirely probably incurring broken legs, maybe broken pelvis, perhaps a broken spine. They'll have some soft tissue damage, gravel rash, lacerations, 
but they won't have a fractured skull. At least that's what happened with the one kangaroo or wallaby every two years over the past 12 years, which managed to jump up in front of my vehicle at night when I was traveling between 80 and 100 kilometers an hour on a secondary or tertiary bitumen road, occasionally on a gravel road, but we're talking roughly 80 kilometers per hour average, so 50 miles an hour, cruising along. And what happens is that the kangaroo is not actually designed as a nocturnal browser. It can see reasonably well in moonlight or good starlight. It becomes frightened by the noise of the car's approaching tyres on the road and the aerodynamic whistles and other secondary harmonics. And the kangaroo's first instinctive reaction upon being frightened is to freeze. So they stand and freeze maybe as close to the road as I am at the moment. Once the car gets to maybe five metres away, that's when the kangaroo can't stand the, the fright of the noise and the fact that the approaching cone of brilliance from the headlights of the car has destroyed the kangaroo's night vision. And the only thing the kangaroo can see is the cone of brilliance in front of the headlight. So that's about where the kangaroo jumps at a distance of say five meters, 15 feet. 15 feet when the car is doing 75 feet per second. A fifth of a second. It's maybe enough time to get your brakes to begin to bite before you actually run into the kangaroo. So it's a kind of an unavoidable fact of life driving on country roads. If I've hit a kangaroo every two years and I've been driving for 37 years, I must have run into 17 or 18 kangaroos. Yet I've never actually run into a pedestrian, not even gone close or frightened myself. Now, why would that be? Could it be because the kangaroos are jumping into the headlights at night when I'm driving at 80 kilometres an hour, whereas the pedestrians are in town under street lamps and I'm driving at either 50 kilometres an hour at night or if it's during the day and it's near a school, I'll be down to 40 kilometres an hour. So even if a child does run out in front of my car at a distance of 15 feet, I've got nearly half a second before I get there, twice the time. And because half mass times velocity squared equals energy, the car's going to arrive with a quarter of the kinetic energy that it hits the kangaroo with. And considering that panel beating and repairs and electrical parts replacements for hitting a kangaroo with the front corner of the vehicle, somewhere between one and $2,000 on this two and a half thousand dollar when I bought it 13 years ago type 1983 vehicle. So this bull bar has saved somewhere between six and twelve thousand dollars worth of automotive repairs and of course if they go in through the radiator you might pretty much have to write the car off. So therefore as I hope to drive this one for another dozen years on the same roads I figured it might be a clever idea to put a bull bar on it because I haven't got one or two thousand dollars every two years to throw at repairing the front end of a Forester when I get the inevitable roost strike while driving at night on secondary and tertiary rural roads. And here's the first big surprise. The bottom centre bar is exactly the same height on the Forester's bull bar as it is on the Touring Wagon's bull bar mount which runs across horizontally the entire width of the car chassis. So yeah, it's low, but no lower than the old one. At least not in the center. The bottom tube, wing, sail, whatever you want to call it, it is two and a half centimeters or an inch lower. And as you can see, The ski tubes, they're a full four inches lower, nearly a hundred millimetres lower than the centre bar. Not actually much lower than the bottom of the rest of the car though. 
And as you can see by the wear marks through the paint on the mounting bolt, on the angle of the dangle adjustment box, shall we call it, which goes between the bull bar and the adapter plate for the car, we've managed to go from well, probably five degrees nose down to about five or six degrees nose up and therefore acquired an extra 35 millimeters or a bit over an inch and a half worth of ground clearance under the ski tubes and it's also transferred the lowest point about 30 centimeters rearwards and that has actually cut the number of ground strikes by about 80 percent on your average trip into town one location instead of five locations so uh that's good that's good i'm pleased with that yesterday i took a trip to the deep water dump with the trailer and i didn't have a ground strike all day so it's workable now for the pedestrian impact version showing 22 on the scale and you had two and a half inches for the case or five centimeters um, so 56 plus 5 61 centimeters or 24 inches from the ground to the leading edge or what i would call the impact bar so all that new fan dangle isn't it marvelous technology means that you run into the pedestrian four inches lower so they can be eight inches shorter which is 20 centimeters less height and they can still get their skull fractured on the bonnet instead of having their legs broken going underneath so while this will only fracture your skull if you're 12 or over this will fracture your skull if you're as young as 10 and somehow i'm not entirely certain that that's actually an improvement orthopedics is easier to fix than neurological deficit so what else is the triplane bull bar good for well for a start i'll draw your attention to the fact that it is a swept wing triplane bull bar whereas this one employs straight wing technology meaning its round section tubing is perpendicular to the airflow all of it airflow perpendicularity only on the central nudge bar the rest is swept back at 30 degrees the radiator mount lighting protection bar is raised which means that it has a shorter length before reverting to the 30 degrees swept panel even the bottom wing is swept back 25 degrees hello dizzy dizzy the disabled kangaroo has a paralyzed right arm because of a brachial plexus lesion from being hit by somebody's bull bar she's a bit interested in this as we see a circular tube has a one-to-one -one cross-sectional area length to thickness and aerodynamically that's going to make as much drag as a streamlined section five times the thickness from our original tube to something like that and that's only well 2.93 to one that particular one but something like three to one so as a low speed aerodynamics consultant what i find exciting about the new bull bar is that only one quarter of its tubing presents a circular cross section to the airflow whereas three quarters of it is swept wing and it's presenting a 1.33 to 1 fineness ratio so i can expect this bull bar to have a bit less than half the aerodynamic drag or built-in headwind as generated by this old technology bull bar and so therefore that's and because I can justify having a bull bar. Warbles on lock to YouTube. Ciao.